their purpose or God's purpose for their life? Raise your hand. All right. Can you give? Oh, yeah. That's Miles Monroe. I love Miles Monroe. Miles Monroe is awesome. He's very kingdom minded, and I've never heard anything bad or weird from him. Um, amen. All right. So, uh, can you help me out for a second on that uh, on that table? Oh, no, right there. Yeah, right there. Chair. Are two hand everybody one of each. You can just have them pass it around. Pa- being passed around right now. These are sheets I made just for ease, and because y'all are ministers. I like things simple and concise in a sense of when I'm out on the street, when I'm doing stuff, I can just give a person a few scriptures and explain it very simply. So what you're getting is a sheet that says truth about Jesus in his hometown and generational curses. What do you all do first? What do you all do first? Generational curses or truth about his hometown? Generational Generational curses. All right. So break out generational curses, and if you have session four, um, the outline, the outline just gives you these scriptures. So just go, just have the generational curses outline, or excuse me, you know, the sheet that you're getting now, and we'll go over that. This is just taken from the Bible, so if you need to go back and study generational curses, or why they're not a real thing, uh, then you know, use your scriptures and study it out. But I, I actually printed out the scriptures. All right, so this is what I, I could, I could just tell you this. I have it in my heart when I talk to people. I have four things that I talk about. Exodus 20, Ezekiel 18, Galatians 3.13, and John 5, or John 9. So I have that already in me. So when I'm talking to people, because generational curses is a big thing. If you go online right now and look on Amazon for generational curses books, you're probably going to find 40 or 50 of them. And you might find one or two that says generational curses are false teachings, generational curses aren't for us, whatever, you know what I'm saying? So there's going to be a couple of them that are actually truthful. All right, so don't believe me. Believe the Word of God. All right, so we're going to study the Word of God and see what it, it says and what Jesus said about generational curses. All right, on the very top, you can read that. But basically, generational curse, the teaching of today out there in Christian land, is if somebody in your family, granddad, dad, some Neanderthal in the you know billion years ago did something, then that sin travels down to you and affects you in some way. All right, that that's the teaching. And so a lot of times when you're out ministering to people or in church, people think that they have this sickness, they have this disease, they have something because it's a generational curse. That somebody did, and so they're reaping the effects of that. Um, I was an alcoholic. My dad was an alcoholic. This is true. I was an alcoholic. My dad was an alcoholic. My grandfather on his side was an alcoholic. But there's no generational curse. We're going to see why that is in just a minute. So we'll talk about generational curses. And the question that always pops up is, why do I have the same thing my mom had, my dad had, or whatever? There's two things. Things are genetic and things are learned behavior. So that, that's separate then with the teaching of generational curses. So I started drinking because I grabbed a beer and I started drinking. No one put a gun to my head and made me start drinking. Oh, it got quiet in here. All right, so even though my dad was an alcoholic and my grandfather was, their choice had no nothing to do with me. I chose to start drinking. Was I predisposed? Maybe, I don't know. Was it genetic? Possibly. It doesn't matter. But that's a genetic thing. Those can be healed because of the power of God and everything we just talked about. Um, Learned behavior is just you saw and learned this behavior and then you started doing it. You know, fill in the blank of whatever that learned behavior is. So there's a bit of a difference, and I want to show you where things come from. Um, But no matter what the person has, sickness, disease, you know, addiction, whatever it is, the power of God can free them no matter how they got it. Yes. But when it's when it's the attitude 
you know, passed so much. And I read and I forgot what that person was called to break that cycle. Would you know that what that person was called to break that cycle? I hear what you're saying. I'm going to try to say it in a nice way. You break the cycle. Yeah. You break it. <laughs> It, it's in your soul. So you have, I, mean, I don't know what you're talking about necessarily, but there's a lot of learned behavior that we choose to do and attitudes. Yeah. You break it. Yeah. There's nothing you can pray about it. Right. You break it. You're renewing your mind, your attitudes, yeah. your emotions, and your feelings about whatever it is. So you, you are responsible for that. There's nothing you can do outside of yourself, and we're going to see that in a minute, to break that. There's no generational curse. There's no generational attitude. There's no generational whatever. That's affecting you. It, it's on you or on me. Does that make sense? And we're going to see that in just a minute. And there's no condemnation. It's just you're renewing your mind for your attitude, your beliefs, your feelings, your emotions, all those things. You're just responding to something in a bad way for whatever that is, your attitude or whatever it is. All right. So if you have your sheet, generational curses, go down to Exodus 20 and we'll just read it. Um, for I, the Lord, your God am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me. All right, raise your hand if you hate God. Nobody? Nobody in here? Okay. What covenant is Exodus in? It's in the Old Covenant. What covenant do you live in? That's the biggest thing right there. Where's my books at? They're using my books. So you do not operate in the Old Covenant unless you're a Jewish person who's like 2,000 years old. And even then, you're still in the, old, the New Covenant. All right. So we're, we're going to crush this thing several ways to Sunday. So Old Covenant, New Covenant. When you get, understand Old Covenant, New Covenant, that's a big thing. So this is not given to you because you're not Jewish and you're not in this time period. Secondly, even if you were, do you hate God? No. No. Okay, so what happens? But, in, in every book ever written about generational curses and teachings, they stop right there. They don't read the Bible in context, rightly dividing the word. All right, let's continue the scripture and see what it says. But, showing mercy to thousands. How many? Thousands. How many? Thousands. To those who love me and keep my commands. Who loves God in here? All right. What category do you fall under, even if you were in the Old Covenant, with this? All right. You love God, you're going to be shown mercy and not um, showing visiting the iniquities of the fathers upon the... You don't get that. So if you hate God, you get that. If you love God, you get this. All right. Another Old Testament, New Testament mindset is Old Testament is, if I do this, this, and this, then I get this. That's how it operated. That's how God had it operate, because man was sinful. He couldn't deal with man the way he needed to, because they were sinful creatures. Fast forward to Jesus, the new covenant. Now God gets to deal with human beings like he wants to, because now they are spirit-filled, they're righteous, they're complete, they're one with him, so he can deal with them as he wants to. Amen? So you're not under the Old Covenant. You're under the New Covenant, which is better, different promises, an inheritance, good. Read Hebrews. So there's a whole lot to that. All right, do you see that? All right, so we just broke that one. All right, there's four pegs I'm going to lay to paint my picture on destroying generational curses. I love destroying generational curses. Love it. All right, we're not going to read the entire thing. This is your homework if you want to continue with this. All of Ezekiel 18 deals with this. God says, no longer can you say this parable in Israel that the son's teeth are set on edge or the generational curse that we talk about. So he talks about in all of Ezekiel, you're done with this. This is nullified. What's going to happen is, and you see in your scripture here, the soul who sins shall die. The son shall not bear the guilt of the father, nor the father bear the guilt of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon himself, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon himself. That's Ezekiel 18 in a nutshell. So what the father does, 
he is accountable for. What the son does, he is accountable for. Does that make sense? This is still Old Testament. So God, through the Old Testament, nullified Exodus 20. He said, the soul that sins shall die. You're responsible for your sin. You're responsible for your sin. You're responsible for your sin. It doesn't travel up and down and all around. Okay? Is that crystal clear? If you want more, read all the chapter. He de painfully details the whole thing in Ezekiel 18. All right. Fast forward to Galatians 3.13. What covenant, covenant are we in? All righty. What book is, what covenant is the Galatians book in? All righty then. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. There's more to this, but when Jesus died on the cross, there's many things he took with him. He nullified the Ten Commandments and took it and nailed it. He took our sin, he took our shame, he took our guilt, he took our aloneness, he took, took our separation from God, he took our condemnation. You want to keep going? I have a whole teaching on this. So he took the curse. Where the, what, is it, what is a curse and where did it come from? We talked about this yesterday. How did sin, death, disease come into the... Through Adam, through the fall, and when Satan took over dominion, all that happened. And that's the curse. So you have a curse, and you have the curse, and you have little curses that witches try to... I don't know what they say or do, but they try to put a little curse on you. It, it comes this way, and it goes... It's like the Matrix. I'm like... It hits me, it just dissolves, and so the curse causeless shall not come upon me. Why? I'm, do you get it now? I'm blessed. I'm blessed. <laughs> Pastor Russell is blessed. You can see all your little chants and your little dust things and you know voodoo doll. It has zero effect on me because I'm in Christ. I'm hidden. I'm hidden in Him. The devil comes along and says, "You remember Russell?" That crazy fool in the Navy, where'd he go? Oh, he's dead. He's dead? Okay. Gone. I went over here. <laughs> I died in August of 94. I was buried with Christ, and I was raised to new life. The devil's like, where's Russell at? He ain't going to find me. He ain't going to find me, because I'm in Christ. Amen. So I'm just preaching myself and getting myself happy. All right, so... um. <laughs> So, so who took the curse for you? Jesus. Raise your hand if you're a believer. Raise your hand if you're in the New Covenant. Where is the curse? Jesus took it and nailed it to the cross. So how can you have a generational curse? How? How, how can you preach the New Covenant, the New Creation, and have a generation? How? It doesn't work. All right, we'll take another step further. All right, so, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children of the third and fourth generation. If you're born again, how far back does your genealogy go? It goes to Jesus. I'm going to stop. I'm, mic drop. <laughs> so your genealogy, spiritually, goes back to Jesus. So your whole family lineage is Jesus. So you can't have a generational curse. Because you're in Christ, and what did he do with the curse? Took it and placed it on the cross and then buried it. Is this crystal clear? All right, so if you're feeling effects of things, it's generally learned behavior or it's genetics. Uh, my mom had cancer, so I'm going to get cancer. That's a real thing, and it's genetics, but it's not a generational curse. It's just genetics. Pastor Russell, how do you get rid of cancer? Right? Cast it out. Lay hands on it. I don't, I don't ask anybody about generational curses. I've been doing this 13 years. I've never once mentioned generational curses or asked anybody about generational curses. It doesn't exist. The question that I hear y'all's brains, there's ministries out there that do generational curses and cast them. Why does that work? Because they believe it. They believe if I have if I can break this generational curse, this person's going to be healed and free. They do it, the person's healed and free, because they believe it. Doesn't mean it's biblical, 
or accurate. It just means they believe it. I go a step further because we're talking spirit, soul, and body. Um, and many of us have seen or going overseas, you see a lot. Why do witch doctors and witches and stuff like that, how can they do miraculous things? Because they can. They do it through the soul. The work of the flesh, or the work of the, it says witchcraft is a work of the flesh, which really means work of the soul. And if you want more teaching on that, Watchman Nee has a book called The Latent Power of the Soul. It's really good. Now, do I agree with everything he says? Not necessarily, but that's a really good book that explains why these things happen. Go overseas with us. You're going to see all kind of crazy stuff. Go, go. Even in America, there's places where these people have power. God, God made the soul. It is a, it's a very powerful thing. And so people who aren't controlled or filled with the Holy Spirit can still do amazing things because it's the power of the soul. That's, but it's just illegal. It's just not Holy Spirit. I think I'm confusing people. <clears throat> but anyway, that, that's how it works. That's how witches and warlocks and things like that, how that works. Um, but if they try to cast something on me, Boom, it bounces off. The matrix. I'm in Christ. Amen? All right, that, make, that kind of side railed a little bit, but that makes sense. So where is the curse? On the tree. All right. <clears throat> we're going to go uh, four things. Exodus, Ezekiel, Galatians. All right, um, John 9. This is really good. How did, how did Jesus deal with it? Since he's our perfect example of how things work, when he was confronted with generational curses, what did he say? Let's find out. All right, John 9, 1 through 5. Now as Jesus passed by, he saw a man who was blind from birth. And the disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned? This man or his parents that he's blind. Generational curses. This, this was still a thing in his day. And that's why when Jesus... Uh, when he was he healed the paralytic, he said, what's easier for me? To say your sins are forgiven or take up your mat and walk? It's both the same to me. What's easier? They're both easy. And he said that because the Pharisees were there and the teaching back then was, and it's very possible this is true anyway in the Old Testament, if someone had sinned or messed up or whatever, they think if there's sin in your life, there's going to be sickness somewhere. So he said to them, he said to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven. And everybody just blew a gasket because he said that, because he's God, and they didn't realize that. And, and he said, take up your mat and walk. What's easier for me? They're both the same. So no matter how the person got it, Jesus will heal them. No questions asked. No questions asked. Amen? Yeah. Then after they're healed, he's like, you know, you know then discipleship happens. And that's, that's another thing. Anyway, so... Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus said, neither. This man nor his parents sinned. So what did Jesus just say? Neither. neither of them sinned. The Greek is a little bit better in describing this, so I'll try to add a little bit to it and you can study it out. Jesus said, neither this man or his parents sinned, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. The night is coming when no man can work. As long as I'm in the world, I'm the light of the world. In, just in paraphrasing what he's saying, he's like, this person's blind. No one sinned that he's blind. He's just a blind person. I'm here to heal him. And so he heals them. That, that's the whole connotation of that. I'm, I'm the light. I'm here to heal them. And he healed them. Amen? Amen. So Jesus... When he talked about generational curses, he just dismisses it. Nobody sinned that he's blind. He's blind. He's oppressed of the enemy that we learn later, and then Jesus frees him. Okay? Any questions on generational curses? All right, they do not exist. If you're a Christian, you cannot have a generational curse. Why? Because you're born again. We throw around that term very loosely, and it's almost we're inoculated to it, but the born again experience is a born again experience you died and you were raised with christ that's the gospel of jesus christ yes doesn't a curse mean that god is exhibiting hatred against someone and therefore if christ is healed how can god have a loving and faith if 
God so loved the world that while we were yet sinners, he sent his son to die for us. That evidence of his love for mm -hmm. us. So how can he be hating us? The Bible says so in the same chapter, do not go for us both spirit and spirit. Yeah, excellent. Yes. I don't know how to say it any better than what you did. So yes. So if you're born again, God loves you. Now, the, can you do things that please him? Yes, faith pleases God. But you're, you're holy, you're complete in him. He loves you unconditionally. That's the new covenant. So the, the, the big switch is going from Old Testament thinking to new covenant thinking. Because in the Old Covenant, God, there, there are curses. And there is a do and don't and rules. And, and if you break this, and this is going to happen, Deuteronomy 28 and all these things. You're not under that. You're in Christ. You're in the new covenant. Amen? Make sense? All right. Praise God. All right, so unless, you, unless there's more questions about generational curses, hopefully we stomp that out pretty good. Yeah, yes. I, I can't always see it because the lights are like, so you might have to wave. Yes. <laughs> so like, yeah, God has to be blind. You know what I'm saying? That, yeah, exactly. That's a good question, and um, that needs clarification because going back into Greek, it explains it a little bit better. We're, and that's how we're taught all the time. This person is made or born or God allowed this person to be blind so that Jesus could heal them and then get the glory and all that stuff. That's, by now, you should, in your brain, think that's not even logically possible. God is not going to make someone, he can't make someone sick. He can't do that. So, and even in the Old Covenant, there's, he, Jesus said, no, no one sinned. So there's always been in the Old Covenant a connotation of if you sin, then you get sick or a curse or something bad happens to you. He's even saying here, even in the Old Covenant, I'm here to heal them. He, did, he didn't do anything. He's just blind. All right? Does that make sense? Um, I do. I don't have it in my brain right now, but I have it written down somewhere where it explains that in the Greek. Um, I would go to look up Kenneth Wiest, look up Strong's Concordance. Bible Hub is really good because it explains a lot of the wordings and stuff like that. Um, but I can follow up that at another time. I can't think of it exactly, but it's it's what he's saying is he's blind and I'm going to heal them. That, that's really the connotation of what he's saying. Amen? Um, and it goes into, uh, I am light. I'm, this, I'm, I am the light of the world, and I'm going to reveal what, who I am in this, in this situation. Okay? Amen? And I'll answer this one in just a minute. All right, go to, if you have a sheet, you should have the sheet that says, in his hometown. We touched on this yesterday, but I just wanted to show you this on how to rightly divide the word. And every time you go through scripture and even the guy blind and stuff like that, what does what the rest of the new covenant say about healing and how does this work? So if you have scriptures that are um, seem contradictory, they're not. We just need to understand what, what it's saying. So we go back to um, you know Acts 10, 38. How God anointed Jesus Christ of Nazareth. He went around doing good, healing all who were oppressed of the devil. For God was with them. So Jesus healed all. Did he not heal all? Did he ever fail? Did he ever say no? He said no once, but still healed the person. So he never not healed anybody. It was he was 100% on everything he did. So take that scripture and then put it into other contexts because people are going to come up with, if someone had, this is, where the, this is where the doubt comes from. If someone doesn't have belief, you can't get them healed. This is, this is where it comes from which is a lie. So we're going to look at this. So, um, so he's in his hometown. I'm going to read this. Mark 6, 1 through 6. Then he went out from there and came to his own country, and his disciples followed him. And when the Sabbath had come, he had begun to teach in the synagogue. And many hearing him were astonished, saying, Where did this man get these teachings? And what wisdom 
is this which has been given to him, that such mighty works are performed by his hands. Everybody say mighty works. Mighty works. Is this not the carpenter? Here we go. We know this guy. Russell, we know you. You can't do all this stuff. Well, I'm just a believer. So the people who know you and know you well, we're going to see what happens. <laughs> it can be ugly. This is, this is where praying for family members and stuff like that kind of come into play. Isn't he the carpenter, the son of Mary, and his brothers, and Simon, and not his sisters here with us? So they were what at him? Offended. All right, if you're offended at somebody, are you going to go to their prayer meeting? No, because you're offended with them. All right, but Jesus said to him, A prophet is not without honor except in his own country, among his own relatives, in his own house. Now he could not do mighty works. Everybody say mighty works. There, except that he lay hands on a few sick uh-oh, he lay his hands on a few sick people and healed them. So, with scripture, you don't want to read too much into it. You just want to take it for what it says. So don't add a bunch of stuff to it. Here it says he did not or could not do mighty works. What are mighty works? Because they're different than healing. Miracles. Miracles. It says deeds showing physical power in the amplified, you can read more. It's stuff like feeding the five thousand walking on water, whatever is needed to demonstrate power, he didn't do it. Why? No one was there. No one showed up. There was no demand for it. There wasn't 5,000 people who were hungry so he could do a mighty work. They weren't there. They were mad at him. There's probably just a handful of people. Jesus, we know Jesus. We knew him since he was a baby. And all the stuff that comes along with that. They're not going to come to your healing meetings. They know you. They're offended. There's distrust. except that he laid his hand on a few sick people and healed them. So what did he do with the sick people? He healed them. Does that match Acts 10.38? Yes. Does that match every other time in the Gospels where he healed everyone? He healed all. Yeah, so he healed everybody who was sick. So you can't use the scripture of his hometown to say, because they have doubt and unbelief, you can't get them healed. That's not what this is saying. Is that crystal clear? Yeah. All right. So you can't, when you go pray for somebody, their belief system has nothing to do with you. None. If they believe, great. If they believe a little bit, wonderful. If they have no belief, it doesn't matter. They don't want to be healed, too bad you're going to get healed anyway. Because <laughs> that's how it works. Healing, I'm going to say something that's even more controversial than probably last night. Healing is mechanical. It's mechanical. Let me give you an example. All right, do you remember Moses? Why didn't Moses enter the promised land? He disobeyed God. He sinned. What did he do? He hit. God told him to strike the rock and water. A miraculous thing is going to happen. Water is going to come out. What did Moses do? He started hitting that rock because he was angry, and that was sin. So he didn't enter the promised land. Okay? Did water come out of the rock. Yes. But Moses sinned. <laughs> but water came out of the rock. Because God promised it. The power of God is mechanical. In a sense of, do you remember the whole hose thing? Where's the water in your house? It's on. You have 100% access to the water in your house. You go outside, you turn a little, and now you have water in your hose. Who has control of how it comes out? You do. But it's there, and it's mechanical. I hate to say that, that's a, probably a wrong way of saying it. I don't know a better way of saying it. But the power of the Holy Spirit is there. The promises are yes and amen. So no matter... No matter what your life is like, I, I don't want to go there because you want to walk straight, you want to walk righteous, but because you are a spirit and the Holy Spirit lives inside of you, he's going to come out in some form or fashion. Despite sometimes your belief system or what you did or what you said to the person in front of you driving down here, he's going. the power of God is going to be mechanical. Okay? 
Don't take that in some off thing where you can just do whatever you want. No. Walk in holiness, walk in grace, walk in power, walk in the fruits of the Spirit, but also know that when the Holy Spirit is needed, He is going to do something and say yes to it, no matter what the situation is. That's why you can get people who don't believe healed. You can get Buddhists healed and Muslims healed and atheists healed because it's mechanical. It's a gift. In fact, healing is a fact. Hopefully you know that by now because it was legally paid on the cross or by his stripes. And then it was the Holy Spirit was given to you to go do these things. It's a legal fact that people can be healed. Amen? Yeah. The promises of God are yes and they are amen. All right, we'll keep reading. Uh, all right, so he could, not do mighty, he could not do mighty works, indeed showing his physical power there, except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. Verse 6, he marveled because of their unbelief or distrust in him. Why did they have unbelief or distrust? They were offended at him. Why were they offended at him? They knew him. All right. Then he went around the villages in the circuit teaching. All right. There's a sister verse to that, and it's Matthew 13. You can read that on your own. It says similar thing, but Mark is a little more, uh, there's more detail on that. So there's a sister verse to all this. Alrighty. Let's do, let's do one more and then we'll activate and then by 12 o'clock we'll be out of here. Let's do, another big one is Paul's thorn. Let's do that real quick. Um, and there are more, but those are probably the big ticket ones. And I, I, forget, I did not print this and I should have, um, but um, we'll go there. So as I'm reading this question, go to 2 Corinthians 12, 7 through 10. Very famous verse about Paul's thorn. Hmm. I'm going to crush that thing right now. All right. Um, how does taking communion bring healing? How does worship with music work with or to enhance healing? Excellent question. All right. First one is when you take communion, we talked about this last night. When you're taking communion, you're taking the, the cup and the, the bread, what are you remembering? Jesus, but what happened? What's, his, what's the wine or the juice represent? The blood. Why did he shed his blood? For remission of sin. All right, remember that. Uh, he took my sin nature and gave me a righteous nature. All right, what's the bread for? What does that bread represent? What happened to his body? It was broken. To take what? He took your sickness, your disease, your pain, and your sorrow with his body. That's what you're remembering. So when you're taking communion, you're remembering, all right, I don't have a sin nature. I'm a new creature in Christ through his blood. And he took whatever sickness or pain that I have. He took that. So you're doing that. Most people can get healed doing that. If you still feel the effects of being oppressed, what do you do? You pray. Pain, go now in Jesus' name. Cancer, go right now in Jesus' name. Scoliosis, go right now in Jesus' name. Whatever it is, speak to it. Because it's, you're remembering his blood and his body. So that, that's a way of being healed at communion. Another good one is, uh, how does worship with music work with enhancing healing? Um, what I think you're asking, there's a couple of things. We love praise and worship. Praise and worship, you know, that, that, that builds you up in a sense. He's worthy. Worth, uh, worship actually comes from worship. Is God not worthy? Yes, he's worthy. So that's why we worship him. But he's always worthy of worship. How does that go hand in hand with healing? The only way to explain it is, we talked about last night and today, the prescribed way of healing people. You touch them, and the Holy Spirit goes and does stuff, or you speak to it. Is that not the prescribed way? Yes. Is that how Jesus did it? Yes. All right. So God is so mechanical in a sense of, he is going to try to heal anybody any way he can. So that's when we read about the gifts of healings, any other way that happens, that's gifts of healing. So worship, and you probably hear testimonies all the time, we were in a worship service and we got healed. No one prayed, no one laid hands, but through worship, they were healed. Um, at Curry's thing, someone, was, someone had missing fingers and they were worshiping and they grew back. No one prayed, no one did anything. That's gifts of healing. Uh, this guy was playing, Anna was playing piano, and I got healed. Well, that's gifts 
of healings because playing the piano or playing worship isn't a prescribed way. So it falls under gifts of healing. Um, I was listening to a teaching by Kenneth Copeland, and I was healed. That's gifts of healings. He didn't pray for me. He didn't lay his hand on me, but I was healed. See how mechanical it is? God's going to use anything he can to make you well. It's so mechanical. But if it's not prescribed, it's gifts of healing. I saw maybe I have a hand. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah. I know he's going to go somewhere, mm-hmm. and it's not always in me. When I feel that feeling, I'm, I'm like, okay, who would you pray for? Because it's, he has manifest so much when we connect with him that he enlarges in us no matter what kind of person that we are. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because what does the healing? Your spirit. It has nothing to do with your soul. It's all spirit. Amen. You need, you know, like we said, you need your soul open for the Holy Spirit to come out, but your soul isn't doing the healing. Your Holy Spirit and your spirit are one, and they're doing the healing. So however you can radiate the, the Holy Spirit, you can walk, it's like uh, Peter, you can walk by somebody and they can be healed because your spirit is so radiating from worship or praying in tongues or whatever it is, it'll touch somebody and they'll be healed. That's how you get healed too. You just Your spirit is just radiating God's going to give life to your mortal bodies, and you can be healed yourself. Because we're praying for other people, you can pray for yourself the same exact way. Uh, years ago, I had knee problems, and I was at the park, and I was walking across the parking lot. I'm like, damn, my knees hurt. And God said, why don't you just pray for yourself? I'm like, duh. So I, I literally just stood there, and I put my hands on my knees, and I said, pain leave in Jesus' name. I felt the pain leave and exit my body. I was like, Whoa, I started doing squats and all the stuff. I can I have no pain in my knees. I prayed for myself like I would pray for anybody else because it's my spirit doing the healing and my body is just a, it's just a body. I can pray for myself just as easy as anybody else. That goes into another question of, um, and this kind of goes into activation too. When you, why is it harder to get loved ones healed? Because if you think about spirit, soul, and body, when you, when you have a family member, you're emotional. You, you love them. Where is that love? It's in your soul, because that's where your emotions and feelings are. What does the healing? The spirit. What else is involved when you have a loved one? Your soul, because you're emotionally connected to that person. So it, that takes a little bit of time to make sure your soul, your feelings, your emotions are, I said it twice, uh, are under, under the control of the spirit. So um, when and if you ever go out to Walmart or somewhere and you don't know anybody, it's easier because there's no soulish, emotional attachment to the person. It's all spirit. So as soon as you get around somebody that you know or love, your, your soul is involved. I'm not saying it's a bad thing. It's just it needs to be, you have to be aware of when I'm praying for, uh, I used to when I would pray for our kids this is years ago, I would literally say, I'm a man of God, and I'm praying for this person to be healed in Jesus' name. I would tell myself that. And that, that would instantly click me over to spirit mode and I could pray for them and they'd be healed or touched or whatever it was. So sometimes you just kind of mentally make that shift and kind of, there's a word for it, I forget what the word is. It, it's not emotional detachment, but kind of. So you want to be kind of emotionally detached, but walk in compassion. The book I gave you, it talks about compassion. Jesus, he didn't walk in empathy. He didn't walk in sympathy. He walked in compassion. And compassion is of the spirit. So if, you, if you're praying for somebody and they're giving you a whole rap sheet and it's 12 minutes long and you're, you're just in about as much unbelief as they are because they're just wearing you out with all these problems and stuff like that, you don't sympathize in a sense. Don't empathize when you're praying for somebody. Walk in compassion yes. because it's compassion that, that I don't say moves the Spirit, but that the Spirit, the Holy Spirit walks in compassion. Does that make sense? And it's a higher form of love and things like that. So you'll read in the Gospels all the time, Jesus walked in compassion. Why did he raise the one child from the dead? He had compassion for the mother. <laughs> Didn't say much about the dead boy, but he had compassion for the mom. So that's another thing. So, all right. Does that 
pretty clear. So this, a lot of this is just takes exercise and you'll learn so much going out and praying. And today we'll just, um, we're not gonna go anywhere because of time and things like that. But in a few minutes when we're done and answering questions, we'll get up, take a quick break, five minute break or so, and we're gonna interact. I'm gonna have, I'm gonna probably have a line of people over here and then a line of people over here and we'll, we'll teach you how to pray for each other. And so this is a safe environment and then you'll learn how to do that and grow. And then when you're out, you can do the same exact thing at the store or anything like that. So, <clears throat> all right. Um, is that clear about his hometown? We're going to hit Paul Storn real quick and be done because that's another major thing. I was at the hospital visiting somebody. This was five or six years ago. And um, <clears throat> I was leaving and going out. And by the gift shop, like food area, there's a lady with a, she had a back brace on. And it was one of these kind that, you know, it's, she's all cinched up and it's like whoosh, compressed. And I was like, squirrel, whoosh, I'm going to go pray for this person. And I go up to her and started talking. I was like, you know, I like praying for people and kind of pray for your back. Obviously, you're in pain or what's going on. So I asked her just a general question of, you know, what, what happened and what's going on. And she, long story short, she believed this was Paul Storm. This is Paul Storm. God gave me this, I forget what she had, a broken back or something like that. I have this broken back because um, God's trying to teach me something and keep me humble. This is out of her own mouth. Uh, God, God is trying to keep me humble, and he's trying to teach me something. And I, it took all of my effort not to just, like, explode. So I, was like, um, I was like, well, uh, and there's one other thing. I don't know where to go with this. I'm like, how do, you, how do you pray for him, for one? And then in a sense of how do I, how do, what do I say? I was like, um, I was like, ma'am, one, you're not Paul, and two, Jesus died. It's funny, but you're going to see why I say that in just a second. And if God doesn't make you sick to teach you things. He teaches you two ways: through His Word and through the Holy Spirit. That's the two prescribed ways of the New Testament that He talks to us and teaches us. Hebrews one. Hebrews one says. God used to talk to us through the prophets, through the fathers. In these last days, he talks to us in the person of his son. So you're either a disciple of Moses or you're a disciple of Jesus. You pick. <clears throat> so God talks to us through the new covenant, through his son. I'll make that abundantly clear. All right. So I, I forget you don't have this. Go to um, 1 Corinthians 12 or write this down. And I'll read it. And this took a while to study because it goes from Greek to English and it doesn't transfer very well. Um, so I prayed and just tried to figure out how to explain this a little bit better. Um, but you'll see. All right. <clears throat> the false belief is uh, if you're sick with something, uh, then God's trying to teach you something and keep you humble. That's the basic teaching. All right. First Corinthians. 12, 7, 10 says, And lest I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of revelations, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I be exalted above measure. Concerning this thing, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me. And he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I'd rather boast in my infirmities than the power of Christ that the power of Christ might rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in my infirmities, in reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, in distresses, for Christ's sake. For when I'm weak, then I'm strong. That is a horrible translation from Greek. And we're going to look at a couple things. I'm going to parse that out just for a second so you see, and then I'm going to explain some of the wordage. All right, number one, why, why does he have this? For the abundance of revelations. All right, what is the abundance of revelations that Paul had? It breaks down to the mystery of Christ, Christ in you, the hope of glory. That's the revelation that he was bringing to the church. Jesus said, I have a bunch of stuff to tell you. I can't because you're not spirit-filled. So he punted, and until we were filled with the Spirit so we can understand things, Apostle Paul comes along and says, whoa, Christ in you, the hope of glory. This is a mystery. And so Paul has this great revelation of Christ in you, the hope of glory. Who would not want Paul to explain or 
preach that message? The devil. So what does the devil do? So, all right, so what did Paul have? What did the lady at the hospital with the back brace not have? <laughs> she didn't have a month of revelations. All right, so um, I say that jokingly in a sense of the mystery has already been explained to us through Paul. So you're, you're not carrying something new in the sense of Satan's going to throw everything in the kitchen sink at you to stop you. This is why this is happening. A thorn in the flesh was given to me by who? Who sent the thorn of the flesh? Satan. Satan. To do what? To buffet him. To stop him. All right. Does everybody see that? God did not send the thorn in the flesh. Is that crystal clear? All right. What's a thorn? Most people would say he had a sickness, he was blind. Uh, I mean, I don't even know. So the thorn, if you go back and... The, and look at scripture, a thorn always meant a person, a physical person, or people. The Philistines are always called a thorn in the flesh of the Israelites. So I'm not going to take time to do that, but the thorn is always a person who's trying to buffet or stop the people of God. That's why Apostle Paul used this language. He's a thorn in my side. I would say a pain in my neck, but that's, that's 2023. Anyway, so the thorn in the flesh is a person or, or people sent to stop the will of God, the people of God, things like that. All right. It is, we're going to see in a minute, it's not a sickness. All right. A thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan to buffet me, that I should not be exalted above measure. The Greek in that, it's not, it's not like he's being proud and saying, well, God's got to humble me so I'm not proud. He, he, it, it's, it's a fight in a sense of the enemy's trying to stop him from getting this message across. That's the connotation of that. It's not that he's proud and has to be humble because the word says you humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. This is where scripture backs up scripture. Okay? So who humbles himself? You. you do. You humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. Okay? He's like a sin stuff to humble you. Because who sent the thorn? The devil. All right. Concerning this saying, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me. And he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Oh, Therefore, most gladly, I'd rather... And then he goes on. What I want to hit is, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. All right. Big word in the New Covenant that comes up all the time, infirmity. What does that mean? If you look up in Greek and Hebrew, it means a lot of things. It can mean sickness. Most of the time it doesn't. It usually means physically weak or, or lack of something. It doesn't mean a sickness. So when you're reading this, therefore most gladly I'd boast in my infirmities. He's not saying he's sick. He's saying he's weak in something. Does that make sense? Most of the time in the New Covenant, infirmity does not mean sick. There's only a couple times it does. The woman with the issue of blood and it says she had an infirmity for 38 years, that means sick. But most of the time, you're going to see it, it just means weak. And I don't have time to go through it, but you know, all of Paul's you know, expedites and stuff he was doing, that word comes up a lot. And it just means they were worn out, they were tired, they didn't have the strength to carry on or whatever it was. Um, because if you look in here, if you look in all of what Paul went through, he never mentions sickness as being something that he had to endure. It was always shipwrecks and weakness and all these different things. And, you know, he has a whole rap sheet of things that he had to endure. None of it is ever sickness. The sickness is of the devil. Jesus is the word of life, the bread of life. So hopefully all these scriptures are going through your head. All right. So what does it mean? My grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. All right. The Greek, rustalized, Greekified version of this is... All right, say this is you, and this is, actually, this is not wine, this is Zip Fizz, bought to you by Amazon.com. All right, so it's a, just a healthy drink. Um, so this is me, and, and I am super weak. This is all the strength I have. You know, I've been peaching all weekend, and man, I just didn't sleep very good, and I went on a missions trip, and this is the strength that I have right here. God's grace is sufficient for me. So whatever I lack, he fills this up. 
to overflowing. That's what it means by my grace is sufficient for you. And if you read it in Greek, it means my grace. Grace means a couple things. It means divine favor. And it also means more often God's ability to overcome anything. So God, God's grace to overcome these things, God's grace to overcome this thorn that was sent by the devil, my grace is enough for you to overcome this. My grace is sufficient for you to overcome this. Well, maybe, uh, maybe it's halfway. Maybe I have enough strength. Well, my grace, you just need this much grace. My grace is sufficient for you to overcome that crazy child that's going, doing what, just insert whatever blank you need. Whatever your weekend, whatever's going on in your life, whatever thorn the enemy has sent, God wants it gone, and His grace is sufficient for you to be strong enough in His strength to get over this obstacle. Does that make sense? It's not that He, God gave you this thing or the enemy attacked you and whatever. God's just saying, uh, I hope you overcome it. My grace is sufficient for you. Keep praying. It's not, that is not the connotation of what that is being said. You have this strength in God, the sufficiency of Christ to overcome anything. Does that match other scriptures in the New Covenant? Yes. I can hear everybody's brain. Just to review, the thorn was given by the devil. Uh, because of the abundance of revelation. Uh, buffet means to beat down, or if you go to Golden Crow, you can buffet yourself. All right, thorn <laughs> is a... Um, I've got to round out the ministry. Um, uh, <laughs> the thorn is a, is a person or people group. Infirmities can mean sickness, but most of the time it means weakness. So he's boasting that he's weak because God's strength is going to get him through this thing. Amen? Is that at least muddy? At least it's somewhat clear, okay? You get your thinking in the right direction. All right. So that's probably the last big sacred cow. There's more sacred cows uh, that we can go over. The, those are the main ones. Uh, generational curses and doubt, unbelief, and Paul's thorn and stuff like that. So you have to, one thing is to believe correctly that God cannot make people sick. He actually heals them. He can't do both. God is not schizophrenic. Okay? And did we answer at least a couple of those questions? Is it God's will will, will to heal? Yes. Yes. Is it all the time? Yes. Yes. Does he want us to do it? Yes. 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 Has he commanded us to do it? Yes. Yes. Has he empowered us to do it? Yes. Yes. Is he going to grab my arm and make me pray for that person over there? No, so I have to will myself to go do these things and work it out and train and practice and all those things. Amen? Amen. So I think we answered most of those questions. Um, so this is the last session, and we have about 20 minutes left. So we will we'll cut the video off. What I want you to do now is... Oh, okay, yeah. All right, we'll, we'll pray, and then we'll, we'll activate and answer more questions and then show you how to do this practically. Lord, we just thank you, Lord, for the last couple of days, Lord, of um, just digging into your word, uh, being taught by the Holy Spirit, and being encouraged and trained uh, of, of how to do this. Lord, we want to we expand your kingdom. Not only preach the gospel, but we want to demonstrate your power. In Jesus' name, Lord. So we just, uh, over the airwaves, uh, if you're listening by video, if you're listening by Facebook Live, if you're sick, if you have pain, just put your hand on your body. In Jesus' name, I thank you, Lord, that by your stripes, they are healed and made whole right now in Jesus' name. So I command sickness, go. Disease, go. Pain, go right now in Jesus' name. I speak life to everybody who is listening right now in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so I just demonstrated kind of how I pray. I don't yell at people necessarily, but through the airwaves, I just kind of do that.